the scripture that Mason Fessenden will read, I will not be covering in my sermon, but I chose it because I wanted to prepare the way for the sermon, and also, especially, I would like you to pay attention to the last verse. So at this time, Mason, would you please share Psalm 143, 1 to 8 with us? All right. Okay. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy in your faithfulness and righteousness. Come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. When the enemy pursues me, he crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me, my heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago, I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you, I thirst for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails, do not hide your face from me or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, or to you I entrust my life. To the Church of God, which is this morning here at Laguna Niguel, along with all the saints who trust in Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort from which we are comforted by God. Amen. Philip Yancey, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, says that Mark Twain often made this comment, that he had done an experiment, and he had put a cat and a dog in a cage to see if they would get along. They did. Then he put a bird a, 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 and a goat and a pig in the cage too. And they all got along. And then he put a Baptist, a Presbyterian, and a Catholic. And when he came back, there was nothing left. Don't laugh too hard. You could put Adventist in that cage too with the same result. Some people are shaking their heads. Let's be honest. One of the truths of the Bible is that conflict among God's people began very early on. When Adam and Eve sinned and God confronted them about their sin, Adam quickly turned and said, but, but God, it's not me, it's the woman you gave me, it's her and you, God. Right? And Eve turned and said, but God, no, it's not me, it's the snake. It's his fault. It's, it's the devil's fault, and you made him, and you put him in the garden. God, it's your fault too. And we don't know how long it was, but it wasn't too terribly long when Cain slew his brother Abel. Conflict is part of what we often refer to as the great controversy between God and Satan. And we, as sinful human beings, are caught up in it. And conflict occurs among every group of, group of people. When you read the Bible over and over again, you find that people attack leaders in the Bible. Are you aware of that? Leaders attack leaders in the Bible. Even Moses' own brother and sister went up against him and undermined him. David's son Absalom. When you read the Bible, you discover that Peter and Paul didn't always see eye to eye. 
And even Barnabas had to get on Paul's case at least once. Conflict is part of the very lot of life, and it happens in churches more than we want to admit. And it's no secret that at this time, this church has been experiencing some conflict. And I've not asked to turn off the cameras because there may be another church who might benefit from this message about conflict as well. But I, I want you to recognize, and I said this when I first met with the board when I first came here, just because we're having conflict doesn't mean we're a bad church. Please hear that. Thank you. All right. And a little child shall lead them. Okay, I got thumbs up. Just because we're having conflict doesn't mean we have to hang our heads and sadly walk away. It would be inappropriate to do so. It would be a denial of the Spirit's ability to bring healing and health and wellness to us. It would be inappropriate to simply ignore the conflict and think that everything's okay. It would be inappropriate to, to say, we don't have to do anything, we'll just move on to the next thing, thank you. We cannot deny that we need to deal with conflict. Some of you may wonder about my sermon title, Prayer Changes Things with Things Crossed Off and People. I can just hear some of you say, wait a minute, prayer does change things, people are healed by prayer, prayer does change things, people get a job when they pray about it. Pray okay, but prayer changes things only so that God can change who? People. The primary purpose about pr of prayer is not to get blessings, although that does happen. The primary purpose of prayer is to change us to become more like Jesus Christ. When I first started as pastor of the Corona Church, I was lived in, in Escondido for the first three months while our house was being built. And I would drive up the 15, and when I got to uh, just past where the 15 and 215 divide, up by Marietta, there was a, a sign on the billboard. And the sign on the billboard said, prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. The ultimate purpose of prayer is not to change things, it's to change people. Today we are going to look at the journey of the disciples when they were under tremendous conflict. And we're going to look on their journey from conflict to agreement. The journey they took from being at odds with one another to being one with one another. Or as the scripture says, to being in one accord. The first step is found in Luke twenty-two, twenty-four 24 to 27. Luke twenty two twenty four to 27. And the first step was there was an eager contention. Now let me give you the context. This happened in the upper room. This happened after Jesus had given and instituted the Lord's Supper. After he washed the disciples' feet, including Ju Judas's feet. After he instituted the Lord's Supper, which was to, to, to tell them that he was going to die and, and for their sins. What is interesting is that at that time, Jesus didn't point a finger at Judas and say, Judas, you're going to betray me. I want all these people here to know that you're going to betray me. And I want all the disciples to, to treat you the way you deserve because you're going to, treat, you're going to betray me. He didn't say that. He, he almost did everything he could to protect Judas from the onslaught of the disciples who would want to protect Jesus from Judas. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so, after that, after instituting the Lord's Supper, after washing their feet, instituting the Lord's Supper, let's read what the Scripture says. Then a quarrel broke out among the disciples. They argued about who should be considered the greatest. Now, 
different uh, versions of the Bible translate that word quarrel differently. One va translation says argue. That would be putting it mildly. Another translation says bickering. Another translation says quarreling. The Amplified Version says the words that were in the previous slide, there was eager contention among them. In other words, they were looking for ways to put each other down. And the contention was about who was going to be the greatest. This was not the first time. It happened, as you read the Gospels, that happened on a number of occasions. And I know I'm reading between the lines here, but, but can you just imagine Simon the Zealot? He would be on the right side of the church, the conservative side, okay? Simon the Zealot, I can just hear him saying to Matthew, the tax collector, over here, I should be the greatest, Matthew. I'm the one who wants the Romans cast out. I want the Messiah to come and deal with the Romans. I, I promoted that. You've collected money for them. I deserve to be in a higher position than you. Can, can you hear him saying that? Or, or can you hear Peter, James, and John saying something like this? Hey, guys, listen. Jesus called us first. We, we were the first ones to respond. If he, if he called us first, then we must be the ones that should be most prominent in his kingdom. We, we want to be on his cabinet. Kind of sounds like junior high kids. No offense, junior high kids. Me too. No, you. Me. No. Or, or can you hear Judas saying, hey, guys, come on. He asked me to be the treasurer. He didn't ask any of you. But Judas, I'm not even sure we know where, uh, Judas the lesser, okay? Or James the less. You're, you're kind of in the background. You, you, we never, Jesus doesn't deal with you much, apparently. You, you can't possibly be the greatest. I, I should be the great. Do you hear the contention and the rivalry? And all, yes, all, even in the presence of Jesus, after the foot washing after he instituted it, the, the Lord's Supper. And Jesus goes on and responds to them, and this is the first step in getting past the conflict. Jesus said to them, the kings of nations have power over their people, and those in authority call themselves friends of the people, but you're not going to be that way. Can I, can I give my paraphrase of that? Quit picking at each other. It's a very loose paraphrase. You're not going to be that way. Rather, the greatest among you must be like the youngest. Some translations say oldest and youngest. And your leader must be like a servant. Who's the greatest? The person who sits at the table or the servant? The person who sits at the table would usually be in this context either the guest of honor or the head of the, of the group. Who's going to be the greatest? Well, the obvious answer is the person at the group. But Jesus says that's not really how it is. He says, isn't the person that, who sits at the table the greatest? But I'm among you as a what? As a what? The first step in reconciliation is the realization that we are all called to be servants of God and servants to each other. Do I need to repeat that? The first step in reconciliation is recognizing that we must first be servants of God and then servants of one another. That means being willing to put aside some of the things we think we deserve, some of the things we think we own or have the right to in terms of what other people say or think about us. The second step in reconciliation took place in a, on a beach. And I talked about that in the sermon in June, in June so I'm not going to cover it again. But remember the, the story of Jesus reinstituting the disciples 
on the beach when he did the same miracle by casting, having them cast their nets on the side and, and then he reinstated Peter by saying not once, not twice, but three times, do you love me? Just as Peter had denied him three times. The, the second step was God saying, listen, you are forgiven. He wasn't just reinstating Peter, he was reinstating all of them. And so the second step in reconciliation is recognizing that in spite of our failures, God still calls us to come alongside him. In spite of our failures, God still calls us. The next step. The next step takes place when Jesus gave the, uh, call, the Great Commission. It's found in Matthew ch chapter 28, verses 16 to 17. The next step is the realization that some doubted, that we all have doubts. Now, I, I want to read that passage. This is at the beginning, before he gives the Great Commission. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, different Bible commentator, commentators have different views of what, that, what they doubted. Some say they doubted the resurrection. I have a hard time with that one. After all, they've gone to the mountain that he asked them to go to to meet him there. They've already experienced the upper room experience where, where Thomas said, and the, the time when Thomas came and, and said, unless I see the nail scars in his hands and feet, I won't believe. They've all been with him on other occasions. So I, I really don't think they're doubting the resurrection. Some commentators say, no, they're not doubting the resurrection, they're doubting that it's really Jesus. Well, if they doubt it's Jesus, why are they going there? Some say they're doubting whether or not Jesus, even though he has died and has been resurrected, they're doubting whether he's the Messiah. Because he hadn't fulfilled the Messiah as they thought he should. He hadn't gone to the temple in a glorious manner. He had not gone to the Jewish leaders and say, I'm here to help, to help you and to come alongside you. He hadn't put together an army to deliver them from Rome. He hadn't even gotten involved in any of those political issues. In fact, he had more negative things to say about the religious leaders than he did about the Romans. And so some say maybe they were doubting if he was the Messiah after all. And I think that has merit. But I think what they doubted the most, what was next for them? Where do they go from here? And I love the fact that the scripture says that they worshipped, but some doubted. They, they worshipped in spite of their doubts. You and I can worship in spite of our doubts. They doubted what was to take place next. They're no longer arguing about who's the greatest. They're arguing about what comes up next. Not arguing, they're thinking about it. What are they going to do? Peter had already tried going back to fishing. But Jesus said, no, no, I'm, I'm calling you back again. What did it mean for him? How, how do they move forward from this time on when they don't even know what the Messiah is all about? In fact, we know that because on the day of his ascension, they turned to him and said, Jesus, are you going to institute your kingdom now? And then he leaves them. Before, Jesus had been daily present with them, leading them, guiding them. Since his re resurrection, he's only been there now and then. They haven't seen many miracles lately. No crowds that, that are coming to hear Jesus preach and teach. What's next? Can you not hear that doubt in their mind? What's next? Then Jesus gives them the answer when he gives the great commission. He says, listen, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. 
I'm sending you under my authority. In your going, wherever you go, not just going to nations, in your going, teach all the people. That's what nations means, people, not just countries. In your going, make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, immersing them in the character of God. And I'll be with you always. They're done. He's only there now, been with them now and then. No, 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 I'm going to be with you always. And he already told them how that would happen when he, he talked to them in what John recorded in chapters 14, 15, and 16. He was going to be with them through the agency of the Holy Spirit who would dwell within them and among them. And so the first step was, yes, they were in confrontation. They needed to realize that. The second step was recognizing that they'd been reinstated by Jesus himself. The third was that they need to say, what's next? Where do we go from here? And the last step is found in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. This takes place after the ascension. While they are still wondering what next to a certain degree. Notice what it says. After the ascension, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room, the same upper room where they had entered into conflict. The same upper room. And notice what it says. The upper room where they were staying, there's Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. Eleven of them, but that's not all. There were also, was the, the women were there who followed and, and supported Jesus in his ministry, and Mary the mother of Jesus and Jesus' brothers. And the next verse tells us, that there were 120 there in that room, men and women. But I want you to notice what it says again in verse 13, or verse 14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, etc. They devoted themselves to prayer. The last step in the journey to reconciliation in dealing with confrontation and conflict is that we must become people who are not just praying individually but people who are praying together we are not going to overcome differences by praying alone we are not going to come overcome differences by avoiding those we disagree with we are not going to overcome differences by saying let time take care of it. It'll heal all wounds. It does not. It does not. It says they were in that upper room and they came to the place where they were with one accord. That word means they were of one mind or one purpose. How did that happen? What was the one mind and one purpose? I believe the one mind and one purpose was that they determined that they were going to serve Jesus and follow Jesus, and they were going to serve each other and love each other, as Jesus had commanded them in John 14, 15, and 16. There's a quote I want to share with you from John Wesley. John Wesley stated, I want the whole Christ for my Savior. What he meant by that was, I don't want just Jesus who died on the cross, I want Jesus who rose from the grave. I don't want just Jesus who died for my sins, I want Jesus who was resurrected to give me new life. I, I, I don't just want the Jesus who performed miracles, I want the Jesus who loved me so much he gave himself for me. Wesley said, I want the whole Christ for my Savior, I want the whole Bible for my book. Not just the parts that say, I'm going to forgive you. Not just the parts that, that tell us that there's a heaven someday, but also the parts that rebuke us and, and call us and 
out when we sin and, and tell us that we need to be changed and transformed and renewed. Not just the parts that I can walk away and say, yes, it's, isn't it wonderful? But also the parts that make me stop and think and say, God, I have failed you so many times. Wesley said, I want the whole Christ for my Savior. I want the whole Bible for my book. I want the whole church for my fellowship. In Western society, in Western society, it's all about the individual, my happiness, my needs, my wants, my relationship with God. The New Testament, yes, does deal with individual relationship with God, but we are saved individually, but we become and stay saved collectively. I want you to notice that what Wesley was saying was, I don't want to just fellowship with those I always agree with. I'm willing to fellowship with those I disagree with too. I want you to notice that Wesley wasn't just saying, I want to fellowship with those I even believe the same as they do. I'm willing to fellowship with those I may see things and understand things in different ways. We don't always do that, do we? There's another quote I want to read because I think this is the key on the journey to becoming one. Ellen White wrote it in a letter that she wrote to some churches who were undergoing some struggles in New York in 1902. She said, would it not be well for you to seek the Lord as the disciples sought him before the day of Pentecost? After Christ's ascension, his disciples, men of varied talents and capabilities, assembled in an upper chamber to pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit. In this room, all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. They made thorough work of repentance by confessing their own sins. Upon them was laid no burden to confess other, sorry, upon them was laid no burden to confess one another's sins. Settling all differences and alienations, they were of one accord and prayed with unity of purpose for 10 days. Sometimes we think that they're praying in the upper room for 10 days, that that's all they did. Luke 24, 53, the last two verses, I forget what numbers. Luke 24, the last two verses, it says that they were daily in the temple praising God for Jesus. They were daily in the temple. That, that took courage. They, the leaders of the temple were the ones who had made sure that Jesus was crucified. They're his followers. For them to go to the temple and daily and praise God, and then they go back to where they were. We don't have to have the confrontation completely resolved in order to, to praise God and, and to act courageously in sharing Jesus with others. But during those 10 days, something happened that changed them and transformed them and brought them to a place where they were of one mind and one purpose. I could hear some of you saying, perhaps, Pastor Gary, that's well and good. That, that, those were the disciples. I want to share a couple of experience, personal experiences. In 1969 to 70, and yes, young people, that was a long time ago, I was in my freshman year of college at Andrews University, a Christian college. And that was during the hippie movement. And there were a number of students who were experimenting with drugs. And there were some students who were going against the administration and saying terribly mean things and, and really trying to wreak havoc at, at school. The summer after my freshman year, I didn't find a job, so I couldn't go back to college right away. And while I was gone, a revival took place on that campus. And I went back for a visit about a month later on a weekend, and there was hardly anybody there. But the few who were there that I knew, I, I, there was something different, and I knew it. I started talking to people I knew, found out that one of the guys who was really a key leader against the insurrection, if you will, of the, of the administration of the university, that he had gone to the dean of the college and asked his forgiveness. I found out that they were 
groups praying together, not even during times when they were required to have worship, but they were meeting in the worship rooms throughout the day, praying for other students. I, I, I heard of kids who were, young people who were released from drugs and, and people who were, have been acting in ways and other ways that were not beneficial, who'd been transformed by the power of God's grace. And that revival transformed me. There was a difference on that campus because they were praying together. I'll share one other one with you. It's actually a twofold thing. You say, Pastor, that's well and good, but that's how many years ago. And those were just college students. <laughs> Made a difference in the professors there, too, many of them. It doesn't fit our situation. I had been pastor at Escondido Church for 10 years. We were in the middle of trying to buy some land for a new church site. And it hadn't gone while well. we were having trouble finding a site. And so the board decided to do a survey to see if people still wanted to move forward to buy land for a new church. And at the board meeting, two board members spoke up and said, we want, you to, we want to add something to the survey. What's that? We want to know if the members think there needs to be a change of pastors, of the pastoral staff. Okay. Didn't ask why. The board talked about it. Many were opposed, but then I spoke up and said, listen, if the members think it's time for me to move on, avoiding the issue won't help. Won't help. The survey was taken, and there were several other questions asked on that survey. I don't remember all of them, but 94% said no. It was the highest, best response of the whole survey. I'd be lying if I said it didn't hurt when that wasn't put on the survey. I'd be lying if I said my wife wasn't hurt when it was put on the survey. She said, why are you allowing that? And I said, What good would it do to oppose? The interesting thing was, at the next time we were looking at bringing a nominating committee, one of the ones who was the ringleader actually in the whole thing, if you want to call him a ringleader, the person proposing it, had been the building committee chairman. And the nominating committee said, he can't be committee chairman anymore. Look what he did. And I said, no, let's, let's go and let me go talk to him. I'll take one other person with me. And we'll tell him that as long as he's supportive, we'll support him. The committee said, are you sure? I said, yes. And we did. It wasn't too terribly long afterwards that some other members of the church went and asked him to resign because he wasn't being supportive. And then when I was at Corona, there was a homeless man who was attending the church quite frequently. And one day I went in and there's a bunch of, there's a number of children and the boys in the restroom. And there he was all, all but stripped down, getting cleaned up while they're there. And I took him aside and I said, look, I don't mind if you get cleaned up here, but why don't you do it later on when kids aren't around? It just might be better for you and them. And he lashed out at me and said, I'll kill you. And I said, come on, you don't mean it. I'll kill you. Found out several months later that he was arrested for having an illegal gun. Confrontation takes place. But we serve a God who is greater than those confrontations. If we don't believe that, we have no hope. I sent out a, a, an appeal letter to the board members on Wednesday night asking them to be present if they're in town for the prayer time and for today's service. I'm going to share that letter with those who, make from the, who, are just, who are members of the church and not on the board who may choose to come to the prayer time. 
When I wrote the letter on Wednesday, I wrote it with fear and trepidation. I mean it. I didn't sleep well Wednesday night. Thursday morning, I got up to take a walk. I turned on my music from my iPhone, and the first song I heard was by the King's Heralds. Some of you may recognize that, some may not. It was a very familiar song based on a very familiar scripture. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. I don't believe Jesus has gone to build a mansion for me or for you or for anyone else. He says rooms. It's more about relationship. Who belongs in the rooms of a father's house? All his children. And the reason the King James uh, translators translated it mansions was in those days, those who belonged in the mansion were the royalty, the princes and princesses. I think that's a great translation. We are all sons and daughters of the king of the universe. He's preparing a place for us, which I think means more like he's preparing us for the place. He's preparing us for the place. And my plea, dear Laguna Church family, whether you're here or online, or even for those who may hear this secondhand or later on, my plea is that we recognize that as children of the King of the universe, we are invited to be in his presence every day, and he can accomplish what you and I cannot. He can bring us together again in such a way that he will be honored, he will be glorified, and we will be transformed to be the people he has called us to be. That is my prayer this, this morning.